Why do human beings find philosophy bites so irresistibly stimulating and enjoyable? Can this widespread phenomena be understood in purely biological terms, in terms of neurons and synapses and so on? Roger Scruton thinks not. A scientific account, he says, fails to capture our relationship to the world and to other people. Roger Scruton, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be back. Now, the topic we're going to focus on is human nature. The word nature suggests that human nature is part of the animal world or the plant world. We're all part of the same thing. Nature is that biological, environmental thing that we find ourselves thrown into. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, of course, we are natural objects. It's almost a necessary truth to say that. Anything that exists in space and time is something that exists in the network of causal laws which produce one thing from another and which relate the beginning of things to the end of things. So that's taken as read, at least by me. The great question is, is that all we have to say? There are lots of things in the material, physical world which are, clearly are material, physical objects, but about which we can say things which no scientific account can countenance, like um, a piece of music. You know, of course it's a physical object in a way, it's a succession of sounds. And if you gave a complete description of all the sounds and what pitch they were and what volume, etc., all that can be done in physical terms. You've described the piece of music as a natural object, but you haven't said anything about it as a piece of music. But surely, since Darwin, we believe that there is a biological explanation and a physical explanation that could, in principle, account for that, even for our appreciation of music. Why did human beings evolve to be so sensitive to this particular range of sounds and, and so moved by some combinations of notes? Absolutely. You can give an explanation of this completely. Well, we assume, not that it's been given, but the explanation will not actually mention the piece of music. Imagine a, a biologist who is so sophisticated that he could explain why it is that human beings reacted so positively, say, to the, the major triad and the classical sequences that we learn in common practice harmony. What form would the explanation take? It would mention various vibrations of sounds coinciding and the sequence between them, the way in which that acts on the nervous system of a sensitive creature in its neighborhood, and how that produces pleasure in the pleasure centers of the brain, etc. But again, the explanation would not have said anything about the work of music. It wouldn't have said, for instance, that it has a beautiful melody beginning with an upbeat that soars through space, hovers in the upper range above the treble clef, and then comes down by steps which seem to have a grieving quality to them, which corresponds to something that human beings recognize in their own emotional lives, etc. All that part of the explanation is not just redundant from the scientific point of view, but has no place in it, because it's an explanation of what we understand when we hear the music, rather than an explanation of the physical interaction of those sounds with our nervous system, which is a completely different way of um, describing the reality. Are you saying that this is just a different level of explanation or that these are fundamentally different kinds of thing? For instance, Daniel Dennett talks about the different levels of explanation with intentional systems where you can either describe the physical, mechanical construction of something or treat it as if it was intending to do something. And those two things are compatible. It's difficult to get a handle on this. And I agree that there's a response which says to what I've just said about music, that you're just describing the same things at a different level. And I would say, yes, that is true. But levels are also very important. If you take the case of a picture, a portrait, you can describe it as an assembly of colored patches on a grid. And you can give a complete description of it without mentioning the face that is in it or any of the qualities of the face. But that description would still be complete in the sense that somebody who understood it could reconstruct the picture from it. You could imagine a perfect reproducer of pictures who can do you the spitting image of the Mona Lisa any time you ask him, but he actually has never seen the Mona Lisa. 
He's not seen that face in the pattern that he's making. In a similar way, perfect sound engineer can give you all the digital instructions to produce Beethoven's Fifth Symphony first movement. He knows exactly what vibrations at what pitch are required, but he's tone deaf. He hasn't heard what Beethoven is doing. He hasn't heard the gesture from which that thing begins, etc. In other words, here's a case where, although you might want to talk about levels of description, levels really matter because you end up describing something else at the higher level. And this has been known for, I mean, been thought philosophically for an awful long time since Diltai's development of the idea of Feste and Diltai's view was that we human beings don't just explain things, we also understand them. Let's say we have this process of Feste and whereby we relate to them as part of our self-conscious lives and we use different concepts in order to understand things from the ones that we use in order to explain them. And that's very clear when you think about those sort of examples. Many of the concepts which are absolutely fundamental to us in organizing our daily lives have no place in the scientific theory, the obvious one being the concept of freedom. I can't relate to another person if I don't make a distinction between the things he does deliberately and the things that he can't help. For that, I'm presupposing an idea of freedom, responsibility, accountability, all those things which enter our speech spontaneously, but can't be translated into a scientific idiom because there is no place in the, the scientific worldview for the free action. Another way of thinking about that is that we are just misled. We have this illusion of freedom that is very convenient as a way of calming us down, but actually we're not particularly free as neuroscience seems to be pointing out and that the neuroscience is right and the human intuitions are just a way of getting by. That is one way of looking at this, but if you can't live with that belief, to what extent are you committed to its truth? If as soon as you um, actually try to live out the neuroscientific picture, you end up falling out of relationship with others, there's obviously something you've lost. Why say that that thing isn't a truth? A truth about human beings is that they can be described in this other way. It has perfectly legitimate criteria for its use, the concept of freedom. We know how to distinguish a free from an unfree action. What goes on in a court of law? You know, the whole concept of an excuse. When a, the accused before the jury gives all the reasons for saying, yes, I did it, but I can't really be blamed because, you know, we've got a very elaborate language whereby we understand this and make a distinction between the true excuse and the false one, somebody who really did act freely and someone who, who was actually compelled, etc. It's not as though it's an unreal distinction. The fact that it doesn't occur in neuroscience is, to my mind, one of the reasons for not taking neuroscience as seriously as it takes itself. Doesn't it? appear more like a paradox that we have these two different ways of approaching a human being. One highly scientific one, dominated by biology, evolutionary theory and neuroscience, and the other a much more humanistic one mm. focusing on lived experience. Yeah. There seem to be points where they come into tension. It's not that we need to reject science, but how can we explain our strong attraction to the view that we are the kind of being that you've described. Oh, no, absolutely, you're, you're right that this isn't a simple question. You can't simply say, well, there are two ways of describing, there's no problem, because, as you say, they are often in tension with each other. I mentioned the concept of freedom because that's a clear place where they are in tension. But it's also equally clear that neither can be rejected. And one shouldn't assume that, therefore, something's gone wrong. It could be that reality is paradoxical. One wouldn't be the first philosopher to think this. In fact, that's probably the first thought in philosophy from the Greeks onwards. You know, there's a deep paradox in the heart of being. You know, as soon as we think about being, how can there be beings? You know, immediately the concept of nothing comes swimming in before our consciousness. And we recognize that this dialectical opposition between being and nothingness runs through all things. We shouldn't assume that human being itself, our being as the things that we are, is something that can be neatly 
laid out in a series of propositions that are not in conflict with each other. One reason for thinking that we couldn't do that is the fact that we have this deep asymmetry at the heart of what we are between the third person point of view and the first person point of view. I can describe myself as that thing, Roger Scruton, him over there. I can also describe myself just using the word I, but you can't use that word describing me, but you nevertheless need me to use it of myself. And when I do, when I say, look, I don't feel too well today, what I say has an authority for you as well as for me, which no merely physical description could have. And that authority, the authority of the first person case, is built into our sense of the kind of thing that we are. All dialogue is based on it. You can only have a dialogue with me on the assumption that when I use the first person case, I'm using it with some special authority that you yourself couldn't match. This runs through the whole format of, of human relations. Once you understand this, you see how the dialogue of self and other, in the I-thou relation in all its amplifications, lifts us out of the forum of animal life and, as it were, into a stratosphere where we meet in other ways. So you're suggesting there's a break between human and other animal life. Is that a result of language or is it something different from that? The word break suggests something quite radical, that somehow scientific explanation gets to a certain point with the higher apes and then stops and something else starts. And I don't think that that is true. I think that there is a transition from quantity to quality, as Hegel would put it. You can go on developing the capacities of an animal, as evolution did, through to the higher apes, and then something happens due to the added complexity, which makes available a completely different form of relationship between those animals. You can imagine someone painting a picture, a clever person who does it with little dots and dashes of a Picasso kind, and it looks complete nonsense. And just one dot turns it into a face, and a very expressive face. And it's a bit like that, you know, you get to the higher apes and there's one thing that has changed. With that, the one thing that changes, everything changes, because now you can look upon the, the animal in a completely different way as something that relates to you eye to thou. Whether it was language, that's one suggestion, but what comes first, the I thought or the language that expresses it? I'm inclined to the linguistic view, and I think Wittgenstein gives us some reasons for thinking this, that language it is, first of all, a communal thing, but it also changes the nature of the community that uses it by giving a completely different structure of relations between them. Does this have ethical implications as well? Well, yes. I'm of the view that the ethical language that we have and the ethical thinking that we do is implicit in the I to thou relation. Because I'm in this relation with you that I express my feelings and thoughts in the first person and expect you to do the same. I address my reasoning to you. I address my questions. My language is focusing on you, asking for a response. My behaviour is directed to you, therefore based on certain expectations, expectations that you will respect me as an object whose beliefs are properly reflected in his language and so on. So certain assumptions arise automatically in the whole idea of interpersonal dialogue, the assumption of honesty, the assumption of responsibility for your actions and your thoughts. And when people violate those assumptions, we are spontaneously and inevitably indignant, feel abused and so on, so that a certain morality is implicit already in the whole idea of, of dialogue. You've characterised this as an I-thou relationship and thou seems to imply respect anyway. What if you'd said it was an I-other relationship? Because that's what it is for some people. I-thou might be something achieved, not given by nature. Mm. Well, that's a very good thought, and it may be right. Ever since Kant and the post-Kantian idealists, this concept of the self as being in intrinsic relation with the other has been fundamental to moral philosophy. And of course it entered philosophy again in the 20th century with Kozhev's lectures on Hegel in France and then you get it in Levinas and Sartre and Meleponti and all those people who quite rightly 
drew attention to the fact that the concept of the other is an extremely rich one and it's absolutely fundamental to our having the concept of the self. It's that contrast which makes self-knowledge possible, but it's a contrast which also isolates the other as a special object in the world. It's not just one object among others. It's the thing that I address and from which I am addressed. And it's through relating to the other, getting to recognize myself in the other and getting the other to recognize myself in him too, that the whole of the moral community emerges. I suppose what I was trying to say was that there is a picture of human nature which does not see that respectful relationship as inevitable. Yes. It's not inevitable in the sense that we know of human beings in whom it doesn't emerge. And this is what autism is, that inability to see the other as a self like me, or extreme autism. And then there are these falling away from the moral life of people who take some gratification in reducing others to mere it, as it were denying the subjecthood of the other. If we're to make sense of the great crimes of the 20th century, you know, the, the Holocaust, the Gulag and all that, what was it except that? This attempt to reduce humanity to something in which the subject is a mere sort of memory or a bit of smoke left after the, the whole thing has been driven away. And all you have is this walking corpse. And that was one way in which people of limited sympathies can deal with the mass of humanity sometimes. All they can do is find a way to reduce them to, to objects so that they don't have to be answerable to them. Does it follow from what you've been saying that the emphasis on neuroscientific explanations of humanity is something potentially dangerous? Well, it's a very important question that neuroscience cannot be dismissed. It's genuine science and all sorts of interesting results are coming up all the time. But there is something dangerous in thinking that this tells us the reality. This is the real truth about human beings. And that other stuff that I've just been referring to is just some kind of dream or illusion that we can now do without. We can now treat human beings scientifically, you know, as objects that can be explained and manipulated in this kind of way. You're then stepping into Huxley's Brave New World. And that book was incredibly foresightful, actually, about what the temptations are and the way in which people are now giving into them. Roger Scruton, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Very enjoyable. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us. We now have two more podcasts. Nigel has one on philosophers and places they're associated with, www.philosophysites.com, and I have a podcast devoted specifically to moral and political philosophy, www.philosophy247.org. <laughs>